Welcome to the OWASP DevSlop Show. I'm Stefania Chaplin, aka DevStopOps. I'm a solutions architect specializing in DevSecOps, app and cloud security, and I'm really excited to be on today's show. And I'd like to introduce my co-host, Janissa. Hi, everyone. Great to be on the show today. I'm Shanisa Cambrig, a Principal Program Manager in the Identity and Access Management space. And I have the great pleasure of introducing Yasif Muhammad Ali, who is the CEO of SIM and one of our guests today. Although he understandably doesn't write much code these days, Yasif is an engineer at heart that is obsessed with fixing broken systems. Over to you, uh, Stefania, to introduce our other guest. Awesome. Thank you, Shanisa. So welcome, John Bass. Sims CTO, resident DevOps guru, and chief dad joker, and one of our awesome guests today. Thanks so much. Um, all right, well, here we go. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm Yasif. Uh, I'm an engineer, and I'm the CEO of a security workflow company called Sim. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I've got a background in healthcare. I'm a huge security nerd, and uh, really excited to be here and chatting with you guys. Uh, John, you want to quickly uh, jump in? Hey folks, uh, John, uh, I'm our CTO at SIM and I'm uh, excited to speak with you as well. Cool, so at SIM, we make it easier for engineering teams to roll out uh, automated workflows around security and governance, like access control and data loss prevention. And we're gonna talk a bit at the end about exactly what we're up to, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about the broader space of security workflow automation that we operate in. And as part of that, I wanna talk a bit about workflows as code, which is a pretty crucial and cool trend that we're seeing in the market right now, especially when it comes to security. But uh, before I dive too much into that, I wanted to quickly talk about why is this a problem I care about? And, and don't worry, it's a problem that John cares about as well. Um, so, uh, you know, my past job, I was the CTO of a small healthcare company. Uh, I, you know, had a team of about 20 engineers and we were building a communications platform for the people who take care of the poorest, sickest patients in the country. And as CTO, I kind of had this dual mandate, these, these two jobs that were often at odds with each other. Uh, on the one hand, I was in charge of keeping the team shipping, like get the product at the door as fast as possible. We're a small startup, we're in survival mode, and, and we got to get things out. Uh, on the flip side, I was also the one in charge of making sure that we don't breach any laws, leak any data, violate HIPAA, any of those fun things. And you no, know, it's this classic tension of like move fast or be secure. It was always at odds with each other. And, and so I tried to dive into that and look at like, okay, why is that the case? So as it turns out, anytime we had to kind of implement a new security workflow on the team, we basically had three options, right? Uh, you know, and the three options are kind of look like this. Um, option one was stick our heads in the sand, ignore the problem and pretend that, you know, we don't have to do this thing that we're supposed to do. And, and you know, I think we've seen in the last couple of years, what happens when companies do that? It's not pretty. Uh, so okay, there's option two. We're engineers, we can build internal tools and automate everything and it's all great. And as I'm sure a lot of us know, you know, building tools, getting the hackathon together, like building all this cool stuff, that, that's the fun part. The annoying part is like, okay, who's gonna maintain these tools? What happens when these things live on beyond just our little hackathon? And so we tried to shy away from, you know, committing ourselves to too much maintenance burden. And that would often kind of bring up option three when it comes to implementing whatever the security workflow du jour was. And, and that was, manual processes that are kind of tedious and involve way too many humans, right? And so the classic example here was like, we need to put an access workflow around something. Let's say our database that has, you know, sensitive patient information. So, okay, we can't just stick our heads in the sand. That would be bad. There are very, you know, stiff penalties for leaking patient records. Um, we don't really have the bandwidth to build a bunch of internal tools. So let's spin up a, a Jira ticket queue. Let's hire an ops person. And whenever someone wants access to that, they're going to like fill out a, a form, submit a ticket, wait in the queue, and, and hopefully they get their access on time. And, you know, again, we've all experienced this. It's not, not fun. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, maybe there's a, maybe there's a better way. Um, there must be a better way. And, you know, as an engineer, I have a background in kind of um, compilers and in open source frameworks. And so I decided to kind of like combine these two and try to build a solution internally um, that kind of would help with this problem. So what we end up doing is we end up building tools where you could describe workflows and then have internal tools generated from those descriptions, which in a funny way ended up being a bit of a precursor to what we're working on at Sim now. And one such tool was this really cool uh, Rails extension that we built that let you basically annotate models indicating how sensitive those models were. Based on these annotations, whenever someone tried to run a query in the Rails console, we could go look up how sensitive the data was and then figure out 
can you just run this query or do we need to get approval from your manager? And that could be based on the contents, the number of rows, and uh, and you know if it was a read query or a read write query. Uh, and the way we actually enforce this is by hooking into the ORM layer. We would basically make it such that if you needed approval, you had to enter a two-factor code that was generated by a secret that only the managers had. So this is kind of a simple... All right, just yeah, a quick question from me. What's ORM? Just asking for a friend. Yeah, so the o ORM layer is basically the layer that lets you write kind of really nice object-oriented code and then maps that to things like SQL queries. Awesome, thank you. Um, so people would be in the console and they'll be writing kind of these little lines to kind of go execute a query. And our system would say, okay, is this query going to touch sensitive information or too much sensitive information? And if it would, then it would say, hey, you need to get approval to run this query. And the way to get approval is you enter like a two-factor code. And then all the managers had a little app that had the two-factor codes. So they could say, oh yeah, okay, I approved this query. Go enter like, you know, one, two, three, four. Uh, and that was kind of cool, right? It was simple. It was automated. And it was kind of a tool generated from this framework we built. But even then, it was kind of a pain to maintain. And so, you know, what we decided to do at Sim is try to take all this kind of like duplicative work that everyone would have to build to implement tools like this and put it all in one place. And, and we're going to talk about that later. But uh, that's just kind of why I care a lot about this. This is like a problem I faced a lot in, in a past life. It's a problem that John has also faced. And we want to make these things kind of dead easy for everyone. So that's that's kind of why we're, we're excited to be here and talk about automating some of these security workflows and, and the tooling around them. So, OK, that's enough. I, I, I kind of introduced the topic. Uh, I'll stop talking now. Uh, John, I'd love for you to kind of uh, jump into why this stuff hasn't been automated before and, and kind of why the right time to do it might be now, uh, unless anyone's got any questions. No questions for me, but I love this slide because whether you're a developer, whether you're in security, whether you're a CEO, that's how life feels sometimes. You're just <laughs> juggling these different, um, you know, aspects of your of your job, and it's, um, yeah, like David said, you know, if you build it, you own it forever with like yep. five R's. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's that's exactly right. <laughs> cool, cool, John. Over to you. Right. So okay. So right. The the natural the natural. Uh, well, I guess. Yeah, you know, Yasef and, and, and from Yasef and me as engineers were like our, our tendency to when we face, face this problem, let's let's figure out how can we automate some of this stuff. Um, Yasef uh, built some internal tooling to do that. Um, when we look at uh, um, kind of security workflows in general, and that if you're looking for kind of fine off the shelf tools to help you with this problem, like I don't know, our our experience is that security workflows still tend to be uh pretty manual when i when i talk about security workflows i guess just to define the terms like i guess when i'm talking about you know the, the most the, the the hot button one is like kind of access management stuff so who who has access to what and for how long and like who approved it and this is just like a constant pain point for everybody like all the time <laughs> um so there's access management but i think security workflows you know uh you know go beyond that there's kind of incident review is really important um, you know, what used to be post-mortem, but now is we don't call post-mortem anymore, like uh, post-incident analysis kind of stuff. Um, just general like risk management workflows, like just, uh, you know, kind of quarterly risk assessments and, and kind of everything in between. If you think about the kind of implementation of controls for like a sophisticated governance framework, there's just like a lot of workflows in there and most of it's not, you know, not automated. Well, kind of why is that? Um, I guess, our hypothesis is that those uh, security workflow implementations, they just kind of get stuck and they get stuck for a couple of different reasons. So there's kind of this, uh, there's they get stuck between being kind of preventative care and emergency problems. They get stuck between organizational boundaries and, and also uh, between system boundaries. So I'm uh, just gonna dive in a little bit about each of those. Um, so as far as preventative care, I mean, the reality is that for secu you know, security workflows, typically I think get bucketed into the preventative care camp where you know your organization grows grows and you kind of have a system, whatever it is. Maybe your culture started off, people have you know a lot of access by default and you figured out how to make that work. You've centralized access with a few key people that kind of keep you know keep the trains running on time. Um, and you you know there's you kind of know like well we could improve things or it's kind of bad that like one person is reviewing everything or it's kind of bad that like we just have to there's kind of honor system like who's getting into um you know sensitive data all the time but like 
you know, there's a million things to do in any company. And like, you know, you, you kind of work with it until, you know, until you have some sort of incident where then you can't, um, you can't, you know, you have to implement something to improve your, your security posture. But like, if you're in an incident mode, like it's not necessarily the time where you're going to be, you know, sitting down and thinking thoughtfully about implementing elegant workflows to solve your problem, right? It's going to be like, fix, fix, fix. This must never happen again. Uh, that kind of whole mentality, right? And which is understandable, but it just means that, you know, you're probably not um, going to, you know, kind of, you're going to go in with a hammer and not a scalpel to try to address that problem. Um, so uh, uh, that's that's kind of the preventative care vibe. Um, I think the, the second thing I'd say is that uh, security workflows uh, get stuck in kind of organizational silos. So just, just as kind of just the standard DevOps silo kind of narrative that, that we all know, but like kind of applied in the security space in the sense that, you know, um, specifically here, you've got security and governance professionals that they, they know, they know the vocabulary, they know the policies, they know what organizations need to do um, to, you know, to pass audits, to comply with regulations, um, don't necessarily have the opportunity or access to the teams that could uh, address some of those uh, requirements in, you uh, in kind of uh, more technical technical way. So I guess, I think Yasef's example was a good one where Yasef happened to be in a small enough company where he, and he was wearing enough hats essentially to implement the solution he, he described where he, he was the CTO who knew Rails really well. He, he had also learned, you know, kind of what he needed to do to comply, um, you know, from a, 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 to, to meet his uh, HIPAA and, health, and healthcare uh, requirements. Um, and he was able to kind of combine those worlds in a solution that made sense for his company. You know, that's that's pretty special. Um, and that's it, it's it's not often you know, as organizations grow that they necessarily have uh, have that ability to kind of combine those skills and just get something done. So you know, this is kind of a, a, a typical challenge. So, so John, not to get you off track, uh, no, you know, too much, but from the standpoint of who's driving the automation of the workflows, what do you typically see? Well, um, I think what we see is that um, there's more and more interest. Like, I think engineering teams, they engineering teams want to, like, they want to get in there and they they want to do this more. And I think there is more of a um, uh, pe people want to find ways to implement these workflows in more sophisticated ways. They they kind of know it's out there. Like, it's not novel completely. Like the idea that like you could create a kind of dynamic workflow for kind of doing something about separation of duties besides just having like a separate dev team from an ops team. Like people know that people are doing stuff like this. Uh, but so I think there is a, a definite, uh, for us, it's like there's a driver from engineering teams that are trying to be forward thinking that want to push this stuff. And then uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, on the on the governance side, I think it's more like they're uh, they're excited if they can find find things that get the engineering teams kind of excited to, to actually implement this stuff as opposed to just being frustrated with them then that's great but for us it's usually it's kind of driven by uh, from the it seems to be more driven by VP of Eng kind of people that are like pushing to uh, uh, pushing to um, kind of use the skills they have on their team like they have lots you know they've they have they're, they're, they've worked on their infrastructure as code skills and their automation tooling. You know, everyone, that's not really a controversy anymore that we want to do that. But like, let's push that further into kind of more of the processes that run the company. Um, yes, yeah, so that was a great question. Thank you. I think I was talking about like uh, like system boundary stuff. So what I guess what I mean here is that um, the security workflows, like those are cross-cutting concerns. Like you kind of want, you know, to have a way that you manage access like for your organization. Uh, you, but you know, you, you have multiple systems that you're running. So it's like, what are you automating? So you have like your legacy system that nobody wants to touch anymore, but that's probably like paying all the bills. And there's like this current system that like is supposed to fix all the old problems, but did, but created new problems and nobody has time to help you implement stuff in the new system. And then there's the future system that's in the lab that will fix everything. And so you're like, Okay, I want to implement automation. Where am I? Uh, where am I doing that? Uh, and and so there, there's maybe some gravity to feeling like, well, I guess I'm going to stick with manual processes because I I need a I need to basically have a definition for my organization that doesn't kind of just 
doesn't just apply to like one of my uh, one of the, the the systems that my team uses. And so there's there's a tendency for things to get stuck there as well. Um, so I guess just stepping back, you know, the fact that there's this lack of automation, I maybe I should have said this at the beginning, like I think, you know, we think it, it does create risk. So there's there's the risk of incidents in the sense that um, as a as a team like um, as a team grows, like the fact that you have a lot of manual processes and manual review is just going to lead to mistakes and errors. I mean, we have computers and they're good at certain kinds of stuff, and we should like use that. You know, let them do do what they're great at. Um, we need we need humans in the loop of all these workflows, but there are risks there. I mean, and then the other side of it would be like just kind of like the business risk. Like uh, if you implement layer after layer of governance control, like you just, you're going to impact the velocity of your organization. And that that is an important risk to consider as well. So we kind of see both of those kind of risks here and why we think there's, there's some urgency and opportunity to figuring out like kind of how to automate and implement workflows uh, in security more effectively. I think that's it. I think I'm going to jump over to, unless we got some questions, jump back over to to Yasif to talk about uh, some options for how to go about implementing stuff. Um, not a question, but just kind of a summary. Like, I really enjoyed your uh, your section uh, just then talking about, you know, why automate? Because, you know, you tapped on some really important things because obviously security is things of preventative care, yeah. but um, when it all goes wrong, it's obviously, <laughs> right. not, it needs to be emergency fix and you get instant response. And what you mentioned about silos, because what I find is you have your silos, you have your, I think a lot about people and personas, like you've got your different tribes, if that makes sense. And yeah. that's the people. But then when you have the workflow, then it's no longer about the person, it's about the work. And then that gets lost even more. So having these kind of organizational silos, people but silos, system silos. So it's really interesting, you know, the way that you've covered that. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, and I think there is one quick question. Um, so what's some of the feedback you guys have received from your users? And maybe you'll touch on this a bit as you get into the workflow, but um, that is one question we do have. Yeah, you know, I think, I think we'll kind of touch on this a little bit as we go, but the really cool thing we got from the users is a lot of what John was saying, where we're seeing more and more opportunities where engineering teams and the people who are kind of subject to a lot of these security restrictions actually do want to get involved, help automate things, build tooling, and and you know, hopefully tools like SIM are kind of empowering those people to be able to do this stuff. And so I think the feedback we've gotten from people is like, oh man, like for a long time, I felt like I was just subject to these policies. Now I feel like I'm a part of them. I actually have a seat at the table, uh, which was really cool for us kind of, you know, in, in that classic sense of kind of bridging the gaps and closing those silos, uh, being able to kind of bridge the engineering and security gap, you know, a little bit different than like the dev and ops gap, but, but kind of similar dynamics there has been a big piece of the feedback we received from people. Yeah, sounds uh, like John, encouraging ownership a bit. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. And, and, and giving people the tools they need to kind of feel empowered and, and feel like owners um, on both sides of this workflow. J John, anything else you'd add there? I mean, I think there's just something people are, there's kind of an aspirational aspect of people are kind of excited at the idea of being able to like kind of apply their skills to this whole new space. Like that, that's, that's kind of a thing that we've gotten feedback mm -hmm. on. Um, so yeah. Um, Let's see here. So I think we're going to switch back over Yasif to uh, cool, cool. talk about options here. For so, um, all right, we, we've talked a bunch about why we want to automate here. Uh, let's talk about kind of how we can automate. And, and by the way, John, I love that all of your analogies in, in the last section were all about, you know, like preventative care and like emergency operations. Like, you know, you can you can take the man of healthcare. You clearly can't take healthcare. <laughs> the man. So that was, that was great. <laughs> that. Um, so let's, let's dive into some options. Um, so if we look at our industry historically, there's kind of this rich history of taking manual processes and, and codifying them, right? And an obvious example is things like provisioning infrastructure. We took a manual process of creating a database and turned that into like three lines of Terraform, right? There's another example with like CICD. We're in a world now where we can write a handful of lines of YAML, ship it to GitHub Actions or CircleCI and end up with a complete CICD pipeline. That's pretty cool. But we notably haven't seen a similar trend on the security side. So why is this? Well, I think one of the reasons is that these two examples I gave kind of came straight from engineering teams starting to reclaim parts of the process. CICD and infrastructure both used to live in IT or other areas. And as they shifted to become more and more core engineering concerns, we started building tools to automate the process end to end. 
these days, you know, secure, you know, we've gone from a world where security was like a thing that engineers didn't care too much about and almost disparaged to, to something that engineers really feel like they have a seat at the table with. And, and it's more and more part of their mandate as well. And so as a result, we're starting to build tools around this. And, and the thing I want to discuss is, okay, so do those tools have to be code based? Because sure, security is moving more and more into the engineering domain, but no code or low code tools are really making a splash. And, and even amazing engineers can benefit from having less to maintain. <coughs> So, so, so what's with that? And, and you know, the thing is, there are great examples of no code and low code tools being effective. Uh, so to clarify, when we talk about no code, we're talking about tools with kind of purely graphical interfaces where you can drag and drop components to, for example, create a workflow. And the low code piece comes in when one of those components can kind of drop you into an isolated execution environment where you can write a few lines of scripty code to kind of add some functionality that didn't exist in that no code tool previously. And, and if we look broadly, like outside of security, we've seen companies like Zapier and Retool really take off in the no-code space. Uh, there's this company UiPath, which is letting everyone automate basically everything in a no-code fashion. And even in DevSecOps, we've seen things like people using ServiceNow or Jira's automation features. And, and there are even new companies now which let you define these kind of reactive security workflows in, in a no-code way, such as this one company called Tynes. So if everyone's having such a great time with low code, no code, you know, why are we not excited about building a tool like that? And, and I think it comes down to, to two things, uh, meeting people where they are and finding the right tool for the job. And I'm specifically gonna focus on engineers because that is the kind of slice of security that, that we focus on at Sim. So in terms of meeting engineers where they are, as you've mentioned previously, we're kind of at this exciting transition point where security tooling and processes is starting to be brought into the fold of, of engineering and starting to include engineers alongside everyone else. And, and that's great. But what we want to avoid now is the engineers having to adopt a whole bunch of new tools and interfaces, right? Like that's not going to be helpful to, to kind of making them feel included. And what engineers know is code, you know, scripting, config, and, and programming languages. And, and while a UI-based approach might have some merits, it doesn't really fit into how everything else is done in the engineering team today. So you might be thinking, okay, sure, like writing code sounds fun, but doesn't that create a big mess to maintain? Hasn't that been like one of our core focuses here? And, and I guess that's hopefully where where something like Sim comes in, we're trying to build the infrastructure for the, for the kind of the tooling to let people effectively manage their security workflows with code without doing a bunch of duplicative work. And, and we'll talk about that later. The other piece I wanna talk about here is finding kind of the right tool for the job. Ultimately, when it comes down to it, workflows of all kind, and including security workflows are, are logic, right? And where the, while there are certainly great no code attempts to express logic, sometimes what you really wanna do is write an if statement. Right. Even some of these YAML based approaches can fall kind of short. You know, if you've ever tried to express, for example, somewhat complex logic in GitHub Actions, you know what I'm talking about. When we try to codify workflows, we're really trying to capture a set of imperative instructions. And we happen to have a rich way to do that. It's, it's the plethora of programming languages that we all know and love. And so, you know, I think that's the right tool for the job here. And the last thing I kind of want to touch on here is, OK, we, we've talked about workflows as code and why that might make sense versus a no code solution. I also want to introduce this kind of novel kind of topic of workflows as infrastructure. So similar to how Terraform turned a bunch of, you know, common bash scripts into a few lines of declarative config, it would be really nice to take the shared parts of workflows, including security workflows and make them declarative. And, you know, okay, that might be confusing because I, I kind of just spent five minutes talking about how imperative code is the best way to capture logic. So, like, why am I talking about declarative things now? And and the answer to that is it's kind of, what we've noticed at Sim is that workflows, especially security workflows, are a bit of an 80-20 thing. 80% of the things people do are kind of common shared logic, which could be templatized. And, and I'll give a uh, example of that in a second. And then 20% of what people are doing is kind of boutique and specific to them. So, you know, at Sim, we kind of built a product which reflects that reality. We put the shared kind of 80% of these workflows into templates that you can declaratively provision. And then we built an SDK that lets you express the logic in code of that remaining 20%. So maybe I'll give an example. The example here, uh, you know, we often see a workflow which involves wrapping an approval process around some sensitive resource. Maybe it's a database with PII in it, or it's a root cloud account that has destructive capabilities. There are some parts of this workflow that are common, like I need somewhere to make a request. Uh, I need an audit trail of who approved that request. Uh, and I need the ability to escalate and de-escalate a user. 
Um, but there are blanks that get filled in in kind of different ways for every company and use case. You know, these blanks are, what is the resource we're trying to protect access to? Who can request that access? Who can approve them? How are we escalating those? And, and those are the blanks that people use Sims SDK to fill in. Uh, each of those blanks kind of represents not just a value, but a bit of encapsulated logic uh, to be evaluated. So that's kind of, you know, an example, you know, it's like maybe one workflow is, okay, the thing I want to protect is a database. The people I want to let in are support engineers that want to run queries. And the people who can approve that access are on-call managers. But there's, you know, 10 different ways you can fill in each of those blanks. And, and for each of those, there's kind of a bit of logic you want to evaluate. And so that's kind of what John's going to talk about a bit. But uh, but I just threw a lot of like concepts out there. So I'm wondering if anyone has any questions before that. What? I do have one really quick question. Um, so looking at the workflow space and, and understanding that, you know, engineers may be driving some of this, what do you find as part of, you know, any baseline type of knowledge on security that engineers need in order to make this successful? So we, we find a couple of things. One is that, of course, it's really great to have kind of the engineers getting the, the training around best practices. And we really encourage people being curious about that. The other thing is, you know, we, it's not like we're saying there's no room for kind of like security like professionals here, right? Like we're not we're not saying like security is owned by the engineers, so like you know screw all the infosec people. What we're saying is like there needs to be a way for people to work hand in hand, right? What we still see is a lot of times you have you know compliance or infosec professionals who are actually help crafting the policies and how to meet standards, and then where we kind of come in is around the handoff, right? Instead of kind of dumping this over the fence and saying, hey, engineering team, do this now. We're saying, hey, here are the tools to kind of collaborate on this to actually take these policies and turn them into executable workflows that we can kind of all agree on. And so I think, you know, to answer your question, basic knowledge of the best practices is always a good thing. But but actually, I think a lot of that knowledge comes from this collaboration. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Definitely still need security people. Plug for myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, for, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think as well, kind of to summarize, you've touched on a lot of like topics um, which are like really interesting, especially you know, some of the transition, engineering taking more on board, whether it's infrastructure as code or, you know, some elements of security. But obviously we all have security, so let's keep us. <laughs> uh, but what you've mentioned as well around kind of low and no code, because, you know, see, seeing a lot of market trends, it is starting to move away. You're abstracting away from the development languages. And I actually really liked your example because it's applicable. It's almost like pseudo code. You know, I want to protect access to my insert uh, database with a workflow that lets, uh, who am I letting? Um, support engineers request permission and who needs to request? Oh yeah, yeah, my on-call managers, they can approve the request. And having that really simple, you know, you know, is it a person? Is it a thing? Who has access? That's a lot translatable because then these can be, you know, it's not just pure developers who are doing COBOL and Fortran and they need to understand, mm -hmm. I don't know, switches and everything. Um, it's a lot more, uh, you know, scalable and translatable. So it's really kind of interesting some of the things you brought up just now. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, and actually it leads really well into the next topic, maybe beforehand after John, you know, if we just pull up that slide with the, with the code sample for a second, the other really cool thing here is, you know, so all, 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 all the different blanks you mentioned there, th it's not always just like a, a simple value, right? It's not just, okay, I need my on-call managers to approve. That actually can be like a, a bit of logic in the workflow, right? So for example, maybe it's if you're trying to get access to an S3 bucket in our staging environment, it's the on-call managers. But if it's uh, the bucket in the production environment, it's a different set of people, right? And so being able to actually write if statements and kind of what we got on the screen here is what it looks like to, to implement something like that in Sim, which John's going to go into at a much deeper level, is pretty powerful, right? It's this notion of like, yeah, there are blanks to fill in, but each of those blanks is almost like a black box of logic that you can evaluate. It's awesome. I'm so excited. All right. Well, I think we've set you up pretty well here, John. Over to you. <laughs> um. Okay, cool. So uh, we have kind of uh, two, 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 a couple of different sections here to go through. Um, just some general stuff. I'm like, okay, as 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 we started to think about how to build this kind of SDK for security workflows. Okay, what are the kind of main components that that went into it for us? Um, and then and then we can walk through um, some examples too. Um, so just some kind of like boxes and arrows about like kind of the way we approached this solution. So. If we're implementing security workflows for people, so there's, I guess the key thing is there's, there's kind of a part of the system that is 
uh, the sim land kind of piece of it in the sim environment, um, which is kind of running workflows and doing some orchestration. And then there's a bunch of stuff that needs to run in a in a in a in the actual customer environment, um, you know, where you're, you have your environment with the the kind of resources that we're actually um, kind of orchestrating workflows about. Um, and uh, um, so there's kind of a fundamental thing there. And you know, when we talked about when I talked before about boundaries, you know, that's part of what makes this a hard problem to solve in a general purpose way is just overcoming all the different boundaries between these systems in kind of a, a secure, you know, repeatable way. Um, so there's these there's the kind of stuff running in, in Simland up here, and there's stuff running in the in your environment down here. And then there's there's this person who's the sim implementer. So this is somebody that is using our SDK to actually create workflows. Um, and Ayas have mentioned you know Terraform before. Um, you know, so Terraform is a, is like a way to just you know declare infrastructure um, in in uh, in a configuration language, and um, then on the flip side, um, the the other thing we that Yas have mentioned that kind of eighty twenty rule is in addition to that kind of declarative Terraform stuff, there's also some some Python as well. Um, so this is kind of just like the big picture here. There's like a platform that we've created that runs some orchestration. And then there's an environment uh, within, you know, that that actually integrates with your systems to actually implement some of these workflows um, uh, in in a repeatable way. Um, just as far as some of the concepts in this kind of sim land piece of this, so um, you know, something we found is like, okay, the the kind of core concept of our system, and I think you know, is is that concept of a flow. So you know, we've talked about access management flows, and I think we'll 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 be demoing one of those later. But basically, access management, incident response, scheduling, these are kind of flows. Um, and, and what we've tried to do is kind of put into that initial package of like what you get if you set up an access management flow, kind of like most, you know, most of the common things that you would need. And then you just have to tune, you know, and then you can tune the stuff that's specific to you. Then uh, in addition to the flows, I guess, the other piece of this, the other pieces of, of the like the templates. So, um, the idea here is that um, you might have a, a bunch of different kinds of flows for access management that are all kind of flavors of an approval. Like somebody's making a request, somebody else needs to approve that request. You know, some series of events, and so we try to package those up in templates to kind of provide a way for us to uh, kind of create lots of different kinds of approval flows um, that all use the same template. Um, and then uh, the, the other kind of core ideas in the system um, are integrations and then the platform. So integrations is like, you know, uh, again, to, to service our, uh, to help our customers kind of get stuff running quickly, like um, we've made it really easy to do kind of common, the kind of common case integrations that people want with kind of AWS access management or with like PagerDuty and Slack. I'll show a couple of these things later. Um, and then everything's kind of running in this platform so, uh, you know, one thing I guess we haven't really talked about is like, you know, just like how Yasef mentioned um, that he built an internal tool to do something kind of like this. You know, lots of people have built internal tools to do something like this. I think having the platform here is kind of one of the things that's important or that we think is important to help people is that because then we can kind of get kind of common reporting and auditing across a bunch of these different workflows, which maybe wouldn't be there. So these are kind of some of the abstractions to our system. Um, very now, now we'll very specifically like kind of what does this look like if you're creating a workflow? Like, well, so this is uh, uh, the kind of key thing that you declare uh, in Sim when you want to uh, create a workflow, and it's this Sim flow thing. So um, whether you know Terraform or not, it's pretty intuitive. It's just like you can declare in a file a flow, and you can give it some properties like the template thing I was just talking about, and then uh, a Python file, and that kind of calls back to um, what what Yasa showed up on the screen before. So uh, when I talked about how like a, a VP of Eng might be like really excited about this, it's because well maybe they've um, they've already invested in like an infrastructure as code pipeline or something, and now they can kind of manage these security workflows using that same pipeline, the same skills that they've already got for I don't know managing managing their fleet of EC2 instances or whatever it is. So on the on the kind of Python side of things, like Yasa showed a snippet. This one just shows a little bit more. Like we've 
we've tried to create this uh, Python SDK that like um, lets you kind of hook into and uh, decorate, modify different steps of the workflow. So there's kind of a happy path where you don't really have to put much of anything in this Python file. It'll just kind of work. If you want to kind of tweak stuff, like in this example, I think it's showing here, like, okay, if somebody's on call, then just auto approve them or, you know, still log that they got approved, but don't actually like make an approval uh, flow happen. Um, so, you know, there's, there's just kind of ways to tune the system using our Python SDK um, uh, to, to mess around with stuff. This is, I think, uh, yeah, this is this is what I have before um, I was going to jump over into a demo. Any any just questions on the the concepts here before I do that? Yeah, we've actually got a couple of questions and a few comments. So there's people who are are loving your tool. Um, so great feedback on that. And then we do again have a couple of questions. So you know, thinking of things like compliance and mm -hmm. regulatory frameworks, like you mm -hmm. know PCI and HIPAA, um, how would someone go about making sure those things are incorporated into the workflow? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. You know, I think that the way we've kind of approached building the tool is we don't want to build a tool which is, you know, hey, one click out of the box, you can be PCI compliant, you can be HIPAA compliant, you can be SOC 2 compliant, you can be FedRAMP compliant. That's not, that's not the goal here. We don't want to be tied to any specific standard. I think what we're trying to build here is something that helps you codify best practices kind of across the board, kind of separating the security and the compliance pieces out. So what we're trying to do here is say, okay, we're going to give you automated workflows that enforce security best practices. Those security best practices happen to check the box for a lot of these different compliance standards. And what we're now working on is a bunch of both materials and features in the product, which help people kind of map those core bits of functionality to different compliance standards. So I think, you know, getting to the point where we can say, hey, actually you have these three different SIM access control workflows but those happen to map to, you know, this common control in SOC 2 or the, you know, minimum necessary requirement in HIPAA or, or whatever you're trying to accomplish. That's that's some kind of work and material that we're going to be building for our customers. But um, but I think the goal of the platform itself is to to really split out the best principle security and then talk about, you know, which compliance kind of principles that map to. Yeah, I think that's really important because, you know, compliance changes so often. There's always new frameworks that are coming into play. So, you know, building to a baseline, I think, is a better um, ideal than building to a framework. Yeah. Um, next question would be, what kind of challenges do you guys foresee in terms of adoption um, with the engineering community of, you know, functionality like this? Yeah, I, I'm sure John's got a lot of thoughts on this. Um, maybe I'll give a quick answer and then, I, and then I can let him jump in. You know, my... I think uh, there's a couple of challenges that, that we're seeing already. One is, you know, kind of thinking about these workflows as something you can codify and not just as like uh, some like pain in the ass policy I have to comply with as an engineer, right? Like that culture shift. So one, the culture shift, right? Of like, hey, actually you have a seat at the table. You can be involved in these decisions. And, and, and as an engineer, you should really care about this stuff. That's, I think, one blocker. The second is thinking about, you know, we can actually flip this equation on its head. It's not building tools around like a PDF policy, it's actually taking this policy and, and writing code that that describes and codifies exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, you know, it's just, I think it's a different paradigm. Even for us at Sim, sometimes we find ourselves thinking about things as like, how can we automate on the fringe and then having to like flip the equation and be like, oh no, no, actually we're starting with the code here. And so I think that's a bit of a mindset shift. Um, and then I think the, the third big area where we're kind of uh, sometimes seeing some adoption issues with other similar tools is, you know, there's a lot of um, people out there who are trying to do this kind of rip and replace thing where it's, hey, like build your entire thing on our platform and and forget about how you've done things for the last 20 years and then everything will be great. And I think that's, that's really tough, right? It, you know, as much as we'd like to just reset and start everything over, it, it can be very tricky to do that. And so the way we're trying to tackle that at Sim is to really allow people to start bringing in these workflows piecemeal. Um, so you don't have to do kind of all or nothing thing, but I think it's still still a bit of a bit of a lift in some cases. Um, what did I miss there, John? Um, I mean, the only thing to say is like, yeah, like we're you know, implementing, you know, anything, uh, implementing uh, infrastructure as code solutions, it, it's always takes, it's always harder than you think it's going to be. You know, engineers always kind of um, underestimate uh, the amount of time it's going to take to do things. And so, you know, an adoption issue for us is to make sure like, uh, uh, or, or with any sort of tool like this really is like, can you can you really make sure that you can um, 
kind of well scoped the amount of time it's going to take for somebody to get this thing in, integrated because uh as you know it just it's always it's always, it's always as i said it's there's always some surprise or there's always some thing you didn't expect that's going to get in the way and then and then all of a sudden this thing that was supposed to be a fun you know a fun project to help out the team for a few days has turned into like you know weeks of anxiety or something so that's that's a challenge for uh for any sort of kind of SDK kind of tool like 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 the one we're building is to is to uh, really get ahead of that and make sure we're as friendly as possible to the the kind of uh, the, in terms of documentation and just ergonomics of getting the thing running like that all that stuff is in place to, to help people out. I think as well, there's kind of like a, a few things you've touched on because it's not a case, oh yeah, I'll just write a bash script and put it on a cron job. And then yeah, that's it. That's That'll fix mm -hmm. everything. And I really like, um, you know, some of the stuff you talked about because yes, we have the flows, you know, different, you know, work or, or data moving between different people. But then once you have some flows, like you mentioned, you know, let's make templates, let's make it scalable. Let's make it available for people to use, to edit, mm -hmm. to modify, to share. And then it's not just obviously sim we're talking about, it's the other in wider integration. So you know giving access on aws but then you need a single sign on on okta and then everyone on ops and pager duty and the whole organization on slack so you know having that kind of combination and, and and having that all in place and then the wider platform around reporting um so yeah really excited for the demo and just on the side i am an ex python developer so i like your python sdk i was like okay. i can read that i'm happy <laughs> <laughs> cool. you know it, it's funny we have a team that's kind of half half pythonistas and half uh like ruby people and you know it's like it, it, it was a it was a bitter debate in the early days, you know, like all, all <laughs> Rubyists who who clearly know that Ruby is a superior language. Um, we really had to bite our tongues when we built that that Python SDK, but I think that <laughs> it ended up coming out quite nicely. Yeah, I love it. So th thank you from one Pythonist to another. <laughs> um, awesome. So uh, as far as demo time here, so what I was going to do is kind of show. I mentioned kind of uh, you know for security workflows. Uh, Kind of the, this basic, the basic challenge, and the basic thing that I think that most people um, are interested in in using a tool like ours initially for is some sort of like access management kind of situation. So uh, this is a demo um, in a, in an AWS environment where it's somebody that um, needs um, kind of elevated AWS permissions to do something that they don't have by default. So let's say we have a situation here, and we've got a, a kind of fictional company called Healthy Health, and we have a user that has a read-only access, okay? And so um, they want to come in and uh, and, and request um, um, elevated privileges. So um, they're going to say, and we have a 30-second option that's useful for demos and testing. Um, and they've got some, some reason they need. And then, okay, so a request came in. And um, let's see here. Where is my? Request? This would be a great time for Slack to go down. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> oh, it shows up on the other window. Try just refreshing the page, maybe. Let's see. Because I have it over here, I can always do it over there too. <laughs> so one question in All the right. meantime. Um, how do you guys see this fit into threat modeling? You know, potentially for companies who have a, you know thousands of apps and maybe want to build in some type of workflow for threat modeling. Um, how do you see that use case fitting into this? Yeah, I think the way we think about things, both that scale and with kind of these, you know, specific use cases such as threat modeling that we haven't necessarily built out, is that we want to play nice with everyone else in the ecosystem, right? Like if there's a vendor out there doing a really great job of threat modeling. You know, we, we would love to integrate with them, have their alerts feed into SIM and trigger SIM workflows, and then have us update their systems. Um, and I think that's in a much more scalable approach than us saying like, oh, don't worry, in the next year, we're gonna build one of everything. Yeah. Um, okay, sweet. So my thing showed up here. Uh, I was gonna attempt to approve this uh, request. Oh no, but I I can really approve my, my own request. Um, so I'm gonna, have this other user over here. Okay, great. My my request got approved. Maybe let's see. Did I get approved? Um, if I come back over here into um, our AWS land, um, I see now that I have this additional access. So, so this is kind of just like tables. This is like the table stakes, like the thing. You know, this like this is the immediate pain point that a lot of people have is 
they're kind of struggling either with using AWS single sign-on or, or like Okta, as you mentioned, or just regular you know, AWS permissions. They just, they want to do something to help orchestrate and manage their, their permissions more effectively. And um, you know, this is a really helpful just kind of thing to get people started. Okay, so that's what, that's what this looked like to a user. Um, you know, we were in Slack, um, but like, let's say now we wanted to like, let's just explore the SDK a bit. Um, so something we've been doing that's been really effective and fun as we're working with people is we, we basically set up a, uh, like a repo to kind of collaborate with them in GitHub. Um, Cause again, most of our, um, you know, when we're working with, we're working with folks that maybe they know Terraform already, maybe they don't, um, it, it's, um, we can kind of work either way. So, um, So let's look at, this is the more uh, fleshed out version of um, some of that code that we had in slides. I'm just gonna make this a little bigger. Um, and um, yeah, this is the, the sim flow. Uh, this is the sim flow resource that was in the slides and that we actually were just executing right now. It gave us uh, SSO access. Um, and uh, it didn't, you know, as I mentioned, there's some other kind of ancillary components to the Terraform to make the whole thing run. Um, one key thing I just want to call out here is like part of how we make these uh, templates and these workflows really pluggable is um, we have kind of different strategies that work with the common places people might want to kind of escalate or de-escalate people in the case of an access management workflow. So like here, this is a strategy that's specific for AWS single sign-on. So um, the example we just did here, let's see. We're going to jump over um, to like a separate branch. I just want to show um, uh, kind of how we're going to uh, diff this workflow. Um, here we go. Okay, so let me go here first. Okay, so this is this is the workflow as we implemented right now. This is a very simple piece of Python. This is kind of like as simple as our implementation can be. Um, and here, um, we basically, when um, a request comes in, all we do is um, send that request to a channel. And we can make it a little bit more complicated. And we'll jump over and actually apply this. We can say, OK, when a request comes in, depending on the urgency of the request, we can send it to two different channels. All right? um, so this is just adding a slight bit of complexity to the Python just to kind of make this thing set up. So, Let's jump over into the Terraform land here. Let's go over into, let's see what that do. All right, let's go around this other branch. And as I mentioned before, like um, you can do, you can kind of use your standard Terraform tooling to um, make these changes. So here we're going to, um, okay, now I'm going to look here at Terraform output. And I see that um, I've got some changes up here. Let's see where else changed up here. All right, I've added, I've added some options to my, uh, I've added some options in the Terraform to like for uh, an urgency field. And then um, something we need to, we're working on in our diffs is like, I can see it. I've, I've changed our implementation file, but what I see here is that it's like a base 64 version of the change. But basically I get a notification, I've changed my code. Um, that's sweet, I'm gonna kind of apply these changes. Okay, so I just did this Terraform apply. It updated, you know, and that is and that is a standard kind of Terraform command. And now it made some changes in the SIM platform. Um, uh, one thing I should call out here, if you notice in the implementation file, when we changed it, I said, if the if the if the urgency is an emergency, then um, people can request can approve their own uh, request. That's a key. So the idea that uh, we want to say we still want an audit log, and maybe we're going to want to do some sort of incident follow up. But like we're okay if somebody's emergency and it's like two in the morning. I don't know for for this particular workflow. They as long as they just kind of track that they did the self escalation, that's fine. Something like this. Um, 
I'm just on that. I really like how you have that because I've heard stories from people I've worked in who worked in support and in ops and working in financial services. And the rule was, okay, if there's an incident, if it's, you know, you get there at 10 p.m., if it gets to 2 a.m., you call this person. If it gets to 4 a.m., you call this. And we have to open the banks legally by 6 a.m. So let's hail Mary that we get it fixed by then. So that's a really awesome um, functionality. Hopefully not too many late night calls for those, um, those there. Well, I think that so I'm glad I'm glad that resonated for you. I mean, I think that's the kind of thing where it's like, okay, well, if you create an SDK, um, you know, this is the kind of thing you you now this becomes possible to kind of codify kind of more sophisticated mm-hmm. rules. Maybe there's some resource where no, you actually really do have to get somebody else to approve it. Like it's that you know that and that would be okay. Like you could you you could r- gradually roll this out, um, you know, as needed. So now I apply that change. So um, let's see, hypothetically, what that means is when I come in here and I make a request. Um, oh, okay, cool. I don't know. Now we see this urgency field here. So I'm going to say I'm going to make a request um, for 30 seconds. Fix ticket to urgently. And now I'm going to say, okay, this is an emergency. Um, oh, and it, I just went to this other break glass channel. Um, let's see. And now. Okay, now I was able to approve my own request because it was an emergency. So that's kind of fleshing out that that workflow um, to show um, in that particular um, kind of case, um, you know, how, how that thing could get a little bit more complex. Um, another example um, that I won't actually apply, but just to show like, um, you, you can even get, you know, this is an example that's based on something we're working on with the customer that includes some pager duty stuff. Um, so we showed an example of this, I think in the slides, but like, let's say, um, as opposed to whether a user um, said it was an emergency, if you wanted to allow self-approval based on whether like somebody was on call, right? So, um, and I guess um, the, the thing that's kind of neat to us about the, this whole this whole setup would be like, um, from a like a security professional perspective, if you're trying to document policies, and and you want to be able to say, yeah, like we do, uh, we do allow. Um, we do allow engineers to kind of uh, self self request access when they're on call. That's part of our policy. And, and now you can say it's not just documented. You can actually point to the code and to like the review process that actually, um, you know, inf- it kind of makes that into a control where it's not just like this is what we say we do. We actually have a piece of code here that went through our SDLC process that kind of defines, um, you know, th- th- that this policy is enforced in, in this way. So this is the, you know, kind of, um, you know, this is, I think there's just a lot of more stuff we could do like this. You know, the, the AWS plus pager duty is, is like, there's just so much, there's a, there's a lot to do just to get this right. There's so many different ways to just uh, uh, um, tweak this workflow, but this is the kind of stuff that we're working on today. Um, yeah, I think this is this is what I, I wanted to show in, in, in the demo. Yes, if anything you want to add here? No, no, I think that was it, John. I mean, just, just to like recap that, you know, what we end up doing is we, we had this workflow that totally automated from end to end the request, who can approve it, and actually escalating the access. And that was, you know, filling in those blanks that we saw earlier, but but with code. And then kind of what John demoed there is like, we actually want to change this workflow, right? You know, historically what happened is we changed the workflow by updating our PDF, which says, okay, in emergency break glass scenarios, we are going to make a request in this other location and people can self-approve that request. And then we have to go, educate everyone that we updated that policy and like how people start following it right whereas what happened here was john changed three lines of terraform and two lines of python uh ran terraform apply and what we had is that that new policy that new workflow totally codified uh and enforced uh and so just like i don't know i i think this stuff is really really cool like the, the ability to kind of go from idea and intent to execution so quickly starting to kind of close that intent to execution gap that that's that's what gets me really excited about the product we're building here yeah, I think this is a totally awesome tool. And um, from a vision perspective, and I live in identity land, so that's where this question is coming from. Um, right. So if you think about the identity of things like, uh, you know, system accounts, service accounts, bots, how do you see these workflows, you know, tying into that? Yeah, John, you want to take us on? So uh, so let me think. So like this would be like system accounts of like, um, um, 
like uh, I guess like if a system account wanted to request access or approve access, like could they play into this workflow that that kind of thing is yeah or even yeah you know changing the access of you know a system user or even a device maybe a device yeah. shouldn't have access to certain you know applications or um, you know I'm just throwing things on the wall yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is such a cool idea I think because uh, and it you know what we just demoed here we demoed where where both the request and the approval of this workflow were happening um, in the slack user interface um, but you know the system you know aspirationally is designed to you know it, it has an api where those requests and approvals could be coming in from lots of different channels so uh i mean the the it would the the most immediate one that comes to mind like if a if some sort of system or bot needed to request access but you still wanted to a human to be like is that okay that this bot is doing this? That that one um, is almost is not even that big a lift from what we just showed right here in the sense that just like you know as opposed to as a user making the request in Slack, if a bot makes that request, but I still want to route it depending on the request or the time or whatever um, to somebody, uh, the system would uh, totally support it. And I I, I kind of love that idea. I don't think I was asked that, but that makes a ton of sense. So thank you. <laughs> it's a great one. Yeah, and the other other question I noticed someone asked is about like, are there ways to incorporate like conditions on like the user's IP, whether they're using a VPN, all that kind of stuff. Um, so the cool thing is, right, this is um, this is an SDK. You can do whatever you want, right? I mean, every one of those things is a simple if statement. The answer is, can you feed the info into the system? And the answer is yes. And so, you know, as John kind of showed, you can define expected fields in the Terraform and kind of say like, here are the fields that that you should be expecting come in the request. And what we showed is those fields getting filled in by Slack. But like John said, there's a CLI, it's an API. So you could also have the system making the request forward on the user's IP. We could take a look at it and see, are they using a VPN? You know, anything you can write in a few lines of Python, you can put in SIM. And, uh, and therefore, you can actually have conditionals based on all of these things. Um, and that's pretty cool, right? Lots of other vendors, it's like, hey, do you support checking of the users on the VPN, they're like, oh, we've added that feature to the backlog, you know, please contact us in six months, see if it's built. With us, it's like, yeah, I mean, that's a couple lines of Python. If you can write, if you can imagine it, you can write it, you know? And so that's that's something pretty cool, but the SDK based approach here. Any other questions? Those are great questions. Yeah, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but just want to reiterate um, from Gulid, I'm loving this with so much work to do. This is the low hanging fruit for security. Uh -huh. So you're freeing us up to be able to do more impactful work. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, I, mean, <laughs> um, I think I'm going to kick it back to you, Yasa, for some uh, stuff about what we're I mean, We covered some of this, what we're doing today and what we're doing next, right? Yeah. How are we doing on time, by the way? We good, good to keep going for a couple minutes? Yeah, we can be a bit flexible, you know. All right. Crazy. Great. Happy Sunday. Woohoo. <laughs> right, right. uh, cool. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how people are using Sim today and then what this kind of looks like in the future. Um, so today we have a lot of really cool, uh, sometimes very creative use cases on the platform. So we have some kind of expected stuff. We have um, a company called LaunchDarkly, some of you guys might be familiar with. They're using us um, to support just-in-time access to uh, SSH to instances. So they actually have us hooked up with uh, AWS SSM, and they can have people kind of request one-off access to instances when there's you know something to investigate and actually have that approved by someone. So that's a pretty cool one. We have uh, kind of the thing John showed around break lock glass access to kind of cloud roles or, or root accounts in AWS or other clouds. Um, so that's pretty cool, you know, starting to automate a lot of the frantic things that happen when there's an incident or when someone needs last minute access, you know, putting those in a standard system of governance and automation is kind of nice. We have people, you know, starting to explore using us for those things like one-off database query approvals. So you remember that tool I built at my last company? Uh, we've now actually got a version of that in Sim and, and people are starting to think about using that. So that, that's pretty neat, kind of bringing it full circle for me. Um, the other cool thing we, we scoped recently is a integration with HashiCorp Vault. So people are using us for kind of audited secrets management and, and access, which, which I think is really cool. And, and we're very excited to kind of integrate more into the HashiCorp ecosystem, given that we're, you know, built on Terraform. So that's kind of what things look like today. And then just like a little, little sneak peek of what, what's coming in the future. Um, you know, we, we have all this data. So, so we're going to start building this kind of rich logging platform where we actually want to be able to give audit ready reports. So we want to be able to have our customers tell us like, Hey, 
I need to report for my SOC 2 auditor or, um, you know, HHS is auditing me for, for a HIPAA violation. And to be able to, in one or two clicks from our UI, be able to say, okay, here's the report you need to show, kind of throwing it back to that previous question, how your fundamentals you've implemented in SIM map those compliance standards. So that's something that's kind of on the roadmap. We also want to look at kind of doing a bit more bridging the experience of kind of the engineering team and the compliance teams. So being able to bring things like risk assessments into the fold of, of kind of SIM workflow, be able to do things like, hey, let's check if this person's done their security training. And if not, we should auto reject their request to this infrastructure before it even goes to a human. So starting to bring some of those kind of check boxes into the platform is also something we're really excited about. And then things around, you know, deeper tooling around access management, you know, we're exploring a lot of other templates around data loss prevention and various other things but there's a lot more we could do around access management as well in particular two things we're really excited about one is starting to actually use some of the data we're collecting on the platform to help people automate the creation of granular roles so right now maybe people have an access workflow around kind of break glass uh roles for for incidents but the roles might be like normal user and admin user so we want to get to the point where we can say actually when people request admin user access half the time they want access to like these three databases and the other half it's like this set of logs and being able actually able to help people create those more granular roles in an automatic way the other thing we're really excited about is starting to think about like shelling out to some of these policy as code tools you're seeing in the ecosystem so things like um opa um right and the rego language and being able to kind of say there are dedicated tools for expressing kind of policies with kind of, you know, red, green outputs, how can those play nicely with SIM and actually, you know, be able to stick those, you know, inside an if statement in a SIM workflow, for example. So, so that's some stuff we're really excited about on the, on the access management side. And then the big headline that we're, we're really pumped about, you know, and this is a little bit away still, is actually being able to have user authored template authored templates and integrations. So right now it's SIM that has to build all the different templates, all the different workflows, all the different integrations people use. And we've got quite a stack of them we've built up now, but I'm really excited for people to A, be able to contribute their own templates and integrations, and then B, for us to kind of build a bit of community around that. You know, as a former healthcare CTO, I'm in like five different Slack groups that are like, okay, when we're going through this insurance company's vendor review, here's what we did to pass it. Here's the different security things we need. I would love people to be able to to you know, bundle those those tips up as a sim workflow or as a sim integration, and and kind of give back to the community, and kind of share some of those things. So that's something we're really excited about as well, kind of in the future. Uh, so that's that's kind of you know where we're at in terms of today and, and tomorrow, and um, and we're really excited to to get the feedback of everyone is listening and kind of keep working on this platform that's hopefully going to make everyone's uh, lives easier. Awesome. And we got a good comment. It was just before you had your use cases, but it was just saying an idea, um, approving 15 minutes of admin access. It'd be cool to send a report of the admin activity to approve of the visibility and reviews. And then you're touching on that in your future thing. It's like, oh, imagine if we could do cool reporting and then you can have a consolidated summary that could then be shared as and when required. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really cool. Thanks for that suggestion, Rick. Definitely, definitely something we're kind of thinking about um, with this grander vision of, of the reporting platform, and uh, and we'll be excited to hopefully share news on that in in the coming months. Awesome. Um, I'm just thinking for the, anyone in the audience, if you do have any um, final questions, please feel free to pop them in so that we can ask. Um, any closing words from anyone um, on the team before I do a little wrap up? Just, just thanks so much for having us, and thanks for the comments. And um, uh, we're uh, we're always available to to talk more. And if people have more ide more ideas or questions, um, I'm gonna take note of the, the bot user idea. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And we'll go from there. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank thanks so much again to everyone. Um, if anyone's curious about uh, kind of learning more about Sim or, or just chatting with us more, honestly, we're we're kind of we're still building out the platform. We love just chatting, getting feedback. Um, you can hit us up at uh, simops.com or also um, either of us are, are pretty active on Twitter as well. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. And um, thank you so much. Um, at least from my perspective, it's been a really interesting talk talking about, you know, why we're doing this, why are we automating the workflows so we don't wake up people at three in the morning, um, <laughs> looking at, you know, how that affects, um, you know, the different um, silos. 
um, looking at the demo, that was really cool. Like just codifying those kind of things. Like you said, if you can, if you can say it, you can probably code it. Um, and it looks really, really awesome. And then tying that into not only the other integrations, you know, AWS, Opera, et cetera, all the ones I listed, but also you mentioned, I call it OPA, but good to know that it's called OPA. That's how the trendy people call it. But I'm um, open policy agent. Um, I, I'm also hearing that's kind of going there as well. Um, we do, um, we do have a question that I can, um, find. I think I've been told. Um, it's a quick one. Is it SaaS? <laughs> yeah, great, great question. Um, so you can check out a bit more of this on our docs, but uh, the, the short answer is it's up to you. Uh, we have a version of the platform that runs kind of in the cloud and, and you can just use it as a SaaS platform. And um, for people where that's not always an option, there's also a way to kind of host the sensitive parts your, of the platform uh, yourself. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you again. Thank you so, so much um, for, for this awesome session. For those in the audience, we do have one next week as well. So on Sunday, June 13th, how to analyze code for vulnerabilities with Vicky Lee. Um, so look forward to seeing you then. It's going to be 10 a.m. EDT, so it's a little bit earlier. Um, but yeah, that will be the next OWASP DevSlop session. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining. Thank, thank you to you. our awesome hosts, co-hosts, everyone. Hope everyone has an awesome Sunday. Thanks so much. Cheers, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.